So as I heard from my introduction today, uh, we are more on the research and uh, actually, you no, know, no. So like the core of my work is not open risk, it's my research, and I just use it as a vehicle. And it came out in the end that I had some changes, the proposals with the multi-core because this is what I do my research on. And OptumSorg is actually the project where we put the open risk in a larger multi-core system and, and there's no new tight stuff that I will shortly talk about. Uh, so, those of you who are not in this research community, uh, I think you've never heard of Tile Architectures, maybe. There's a company called Tilera, which was the first one to commercialize it. Um, so, what you see nowadays, most of them are organized in, in that manner, like the SEC was a pure research one of Intel. Uh, Tilera is, um, is commercial, uh, that you can buy actually. And there are many more, like I think everybody has well. Uh, Starting from Sandy Bridge, are, are actually based on network and chip and not on buses anymore. Um, so they are ringing in there nowadays. Um, so this is the area that you research in, and it's um, pretty complicated if you have a look at the design space. Yeah? So type means you have something like a very regular communication infrastructure lying under the green, that's a network and chip in our case. We often depict it as a, as a mesh, and that's also the baseline work that we do. We have a mesh space, network and chip. Um, and on there you have something like tiles and they have a well-defined interface that you know, network and chip interface and you just can connect them and create platforms out of it. Yeah? And so if you have a look at research, you just have like the compute resources there and some tiles, you have the I.O. resources and some other tiles and some memory tiles to the external. And you can just compose your platform out of them, that's the idea. And you have a rather broad design space, yeah, so it's a lot of stuff in the macro architecture, like how we design the NOC, what kind of protocols are involved, there's like buffered, unbuffered NOCs and so on, and for example, the organization, yeah, you have heterogeneous platforms, where you have like more powerful compute tiles than others, and then you can research on the software, how to allocate them and so on, so there's a lot of work in these directions, yeah, like also the memory view is very important, of course, like you have a concentration of the, compute, of the computation and how you travel along the data on the ship, actually. And, uh, some of the research going on, and there's a lot of stuff, coherency, and you have heterogeneity, you put in accelerators in there, like crypto stuff and so on, and the, the idea is about the modularity in there, yeah? And so the internal tile organization is also, so what I mainly work in is more distributed style, the idea of message passing, between the tiles, inside the tiles, you may have multiple cores, and this is where the multi core extensions come to play. Um, but you may also have something like a transparent shared memory platform, which is what you see in most of the commercial platforms that you can find. Um, but nevertheless, usually you also have some kind of DNA or message passing functionality there to faster communicate among the tiles because it's really important. Um, Summarizing, there are many research topics, and many of us are working in there. That's where, uh, in the end, OptumSoft came into play. I was uh, confronted with the fact that there's nothing like an open type platform that you could just take and do your research in. And my research is, in fact, in message passing among the tiles, so um, acceleration of the protocols and all this stuff. Uh, I will shortly talk uh, about later. And yeah, this is now where I stood, and I just had a look at what course are available, and we decided to use OpenRisk in the end. This was like 2009, I think, the first time that I got confronted with it. Um, and yeah, there we had it, and then you need some kind of network on chip. There are also some available. We ended up with writing a new one from scratch that's just a very few lines of very low code effect, uh, because we have a strong focus on keeping it very simple and very easy to understand and to get in because of many students. Yeah, this is just summarizing. Yeah, we want to take something open, we want to have it open again. So, uh, the kind of stuff that we work on mainly is in the end of your simulation of PGA prototyping. Um, there's some kind of tool flow that was intended to be there, but we hope to replace it with FuseStock finally. Um, in the future, there might be something like an ASIC flow. We might also work on a PGA emulation. And we hope that by the end of the year we have a larger demonstrator with maybe something like 64 or 100 cores uh, in such a structure. Um, and yeah, this is just the disclaimer I usually do because there are many people asking, like, can I just download it and build an ASIC out of it? And I'm, yeah, of course, it's research that we do, and 
I don't think it's production ready as most of the stuff that you make here. Uh, it needs some for my verification. And yeah, last year I started with yeah, how does OpenRIS come into play? It's base core that we use. So there were some original plans to have alternatives like the Leo course or something. Um, and this is the slide from last year. So we had this OR1000, I call it MP. This was just the original OR1000 with some small changes that I talked about last year. And this was replaced then with MO1KX. And we had some multi-core extensions, the original core, mainly like in the data pass, we added like a compare and swap unit because core 1,100 lacked uh, any kind of load, uh, load link store conditional or compare and swap. So we had a memory mapped device actually, which of course was a very bad solution if you come to user space, but for like their map it was a valid solution in my opinion. And we had some exception memory that solved exactly the issue that I talked about before some private scratch area for each course that they could work on. And yeah, this is what I presented last year and unfortunately it got all replaced. We have MO1KX baseline just integrated into the platform. Um, yeah, this got replaced with not, uh, word atomic store word atomic, which is the best solution in my opinion. Uh, we now have this core ID, num course, <coughs> purpose registers that you could use. And yeah, I think they're not called like this anymore. Um, the uh, exception shadow registers. Yeah. So, this were the advances mainly. The other thing was cache coherency. I think the information in the slide is not entirely correct, uh, speaking of the actual implementation that we have. But now we have Snoop based uh, uh, cache coherency in there. So, what we also enable in the end is we have a level 2 implementation that is similar to the original MO1KX implementation that issues upstream uh, invalidations for the bus. So this is finally solved uh, on the bus level. And in um, uh, MO1KX, we have all the data cache coherency that we needed um, to run such multi-core tiles there. Uh, the lower part is research and not on the repository. If you're interested in it, we can give it to you. This is not tested in any way. Um, it's running the test case it should, but uh, not, not really ready to use in a normal way. And as I said, like the original thing is not taking open risk and, all, and, and picking in there and so on. It just came out for me in the end that I had to do something in there to, to get my, my multi-core stuff, but in fact it's more the uncore stuff, what we call it. And it's basically the network on chip that was the first thing, and this is really very basic as I said. A wormhole packet switch dimensional routing implementation, how you would straightforward do it. It's very clear, very simple to understand also. Virtual channel support, what you of course need, and configure the buffers. Um, pretty easy, we have some feature extensions that gets more critical than if you have a look at the code complexity, like bufferless routers. They are kind of uh, small, like on the interface, it's less in the network then because this get quite simple, but the network has get more complicated. And we have adaptive routing and a special method called selective discarding, and this is all in the repository, um, and some infrastructure around it, like network adapters, which is my research, in fact, um, like AXI protocol adapters in there, and some monitoring stuff, which has not been used for decades, to be honest. Um, my main work is, as I said, on distributed memory. Uh, we also have something like um, a full-blown cache coherency, and um, yeah, something in between that's a lot store unit for something like a PGAS system, like partition global address space. Um, but as I said, like my, main, my main work, and that's the reason I, I focus on it, is distributed memory platforms, where we have a dedicated memory that's used for message passing buffers and for the mobile data inside there, uh, and a network adapter that has, to a certain distance, uh, depends. Like in my head, there's a lot of support network adapter at the moment, it's essentially a FIFO. Yeah, and some DMA support. This was open source. The other stuff is more research and development. But if you're interested, just call me. Yes. Not to go into details, this is the, uh, the work on network adapters. Um, this is on a heavy development, so the easiest way to do it here is a memory map FIFOs, one for sending flits to the network chip. So flits is the basic unit in there. Several flits create a packet and you just interchange packets. And whenever you get a new complete packet, this is important, it's complete, you raise an interrupt to the processors, and um, they just 
read it out and process it or whatever. And building on this, you can already do some very like baseline computation in there. Problem is, of course, if you have a lot of large, uh, small messages and with a large gap in between, yeah, you always need to observe your case. And so that's the reason you don't want to do this. So at least you should have some DMA, and that's the next step that we have in there, like um, that you at least do the bulk tra data transfers over the DMA. And so remote DMA, you write to the memory to the other tiles. But before you do some very short protocol negotiation about where to actually store data. Yeah? And finally, so this is my research and so PhD thesis is like uh, message passing support, also virtualized so that you can allocate it to task in virtual memory, map some virtual devices, it's called V in Adam. Um, who's interested can talk to me, it's a very interesting topic in my opinion, but maybe not that for all of you. Um, that brings me to software now, and this is not my expertise, but <laughs> something I have to spend a lot of time with. Um, and this is what we spend the most time at, at the moment, it is like how you could see the stack. There's the hardware, and there's, of course, I missed it here, like the new lib somewhere in there, with the basic uh, support for the devices. And there's a little bare metal, it's called, yeah, this includes some core functionality, it's not in the O1K tool chain, and like the drivers for the basic stuff in the network adapter. Um, we have two libraries then on top. The lib message passing does encapsulate all this functionality to send messages around. And this is where you can then run your bare metal apps and simply exchange messages between the tiles. And we have a lean lib runtime, it's called. And if you want to just have some thread functionality, either kernel or user level, those are supported then. And the scheduler, it's like old Robin, you can add your own uh, scheduling, of course. So it's just virtual memory management and scheduling, and this is a library. And you can just then start with an init thread that you have to pro pro provide a linking and without an operating system but some kind of similar functionality you can get there. So you could theoretically use it to port your OS with it. Problem is usually that the code base of the OS is not allowed to do something like this. So you end up with copying files around in the end uh, because this is what we now experience. So this is something that we actually at the moment work on. Uh, two different kernels that we, that we focus on because in such a domain it's like if you take Linux the overhead that you have in the whole stack in the whole software stack is too large for such platforms in my opinion and that's the reason like in HPC you have so called complete node operating systems that are really like narrowed down Linuxes yeah? so the problem is the jitter and the whole POSIX for example is too high to really see the effects of a research yeah? so in the end you have a software stack where the interrupt takes like 20,000 cycles, and I have an optimization of a few hundred cycles in the knock, and it doesn't show up anymore. Yeah. Isn't this ideal for microcon? Sorry? Isn't this ideal for microcon? Exactly, this is what I will talk about now. Uh, so, these are the two kernels that we work on. The one is called Gazelle, this is uh, not published or open or anything. This is something that just bundles together the runtime with the linking and loading and all this stuff uh, to dynamically start applications on the tiles and have the support to start new tasks and other tiles and it's called it's something like a current process network based um, programming model that we have here where you have like tasks and files in between and can just like like a data flow program you just send data through your uh, application and you have multiple for the tasks and this is then uh, the, in fact Gazelle is at the end of only a C file called kernel.c um, that you put in there that just uses the functionality of lib and in the runtime and provides it via syscalls to, um, to the user tasks. And the other thing is uh, called Fiasco OC, that's an open source microkernel of the University of Dresden. It's L4 based, so the original <laughs> microkernel from the 80s. Uh, and they are like the inheritors of uh, this whole thing. And I don't know why it's called Fiasco, but uh, OC is something like, uh, I don't know. Something with containers, I don't know. They just added it and it's in C. It's very bulky and uh, it takes a lot of time. And at the moment, the main part of porting is like four or five weeks that we did it now. Uh, was not in the build system that in any assembler code, in fact, <laughs> because it's pretty complicated if you have a project where everything moves out of the kernel. And that's the idea. So I don't know if everybody used, uh, knows what a microkernel is. In a microkernel, you only have something, again, like a Scheduler, some virtual memory management, and 
uh, inter-process communication is very important to be very fast because everything else moves to the user space. Yeah? And, um, what you have is so-called capabilities that you can give to user space task or container or whatever. And um, those capabilities provide this one, like it's a mapped page, for example, to a device. Yeah, provides the access to the actual physical uh, space. Yeah. So you separate it completely. You don't have any drivers anymore in the kernel domain, but all, everything moves to the user space. And uh, so you have a lot of user space servers, like a UART server that is in user space and has the UART device mapped in its memory space to do the UART. And of course, now that you're a printer, I don't syscall and write anymore, but instead I send a message to the server to print out the UART. Yeah. And of course, IPC has to be very fast and efficient in that, and they try to do this. Um, and yeah, we are porting it to OpenRisk. This is not really focused on OptumSoc at all, so the student didn't even bother account. OptumSoc is using all one case at the moment to debug it and get it running. So at the moment, the bootstrapping is working, it's loading the kernel, but then it hangs up. <laughs> Something like this. Yeah, because the loading is very complicated. It's it's a really bulky project in the end, but I think Linux is the same. Yeah. So I think, uh, or even more. Yeah. So do you map different uh, device drivers to different tiles? Yeah, it has, like, it has the notation of capabilities. And if you have, for example, a virtualized UART controller, so at our institute, we for example, also work on like, virtualized CAN controllers. And you can have several virtual devices um, that is this one maps, and you can also like, give the capability to another container. Yeah, you could say uh, my task does a lot of CAM communication at open send IPC. I want the virtualized one, and then you can you say a fear for four virtual um, virtual CAM controllers. You can just map the capability to access it to other modules in the user space. Yeah, so it, it sounds academic, but yeah, we will see if it's efficient. Yeah. And there's L4 Linux. It's already there. There's L4 Android. These are user space containers like a virtual virtual platform in here, like virtual container. Yeah, so this we can just take from there, hopefully, we can just take it from the code base and run it on there. So it's like para virtualized stuff, and this is one of the strong advantages of using this one for us. Yeah, that we already can use all those user space stuff without porting anymore. Yeah. Once you got this port, and this is a heavy part, um, you can hopefully run L4 Linux on it. Yeah, so I will keep you updated on this one. Uh, maybe you saw a bug report last week, C++. Fails with like inheritance of I don't know. Philip can tell you about it. Uh, yeah, he got the twenty thousand lines of this file down to eight lines that yeah. essentially capture the problem. Uh, so it's only O one. So O zero works. O three works. Funny enough, also, but one and two fail. Like there's some internal compiler. Error. So if somebody is, fixes it, I uh, offer him a beer tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it has to be more than this. Yeah, it took us uh, like yeah, one day already to track it down. But we don't know anything about internals of GCC. So. <laughs> so we got a test you fix first, but then you get a lot of beer. <laughs> yeah. So if you finish it by tonight, you're invited. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you promise to solve it, you get at least a beer. <laughs> because this is really heavy. So I just told you this was already there last year. Uh, the debugging, because this is of course crucial, and what you don't do in such platforms is run control debugging using GDB, because then you have like 64 GDB sessions that are not synchronized. Yeah, you can of course then go into like synchronizing them, like in ARM, maybe in hardware also. But this is usually not the way to go, but instead you do tracing, and this you have to do in an efficient way, of course, in the end, that you don't see everything in the output. But this is what we did at the beginning, right? We have some instruction trace, it's called. We also have something called uh, software trace, where we use this LNOP with the parameter, like we have in this printf LNOP and the exit print uh, LNOP. And we just defined uh, 1,000 more. Uh, and they just like have a meaning, and it's understood by the uh, graphical user interface what they actually mean. And we have like, a, like an execution trace. I don't know if I have, I don't have a screenshot with me. Uh, but I showed it last year, if you remember, there was like the GUI that I showed, where you can see like on each core what's executing, and there were certain events like message received with the same, you can like filter them out and so on. And it just like emits them, and then you have something like a host interface, and this is where Philip actually did a lot of work last year. So we have like, we have, uh, 
has like, separated it from optimum sorting yet and calls it GLIP, uh, generic logic interface project. There are many of those out there, we know, and we just try to build a wrapper around all those open source how to interface the FPGA libraries, in fact. So there's this Riffa one, if you know it, for PCI Express. This is now integrated in the UDF of our USB and um, hardware TCP stuff in there. And the hardware TCP stuff is not. But something like a JTAG bridge where you can just exchange data with your, with your separate uh, debug knock. This is 16 bit knock. Um, and you can just use JTAG to send around data yeah, with your application or like, initialize the memories. Of course, JTAG is pretty slow, so you could try PC Express or USB at least uh, to interface your port. So, uh, this is where last, so last year this was like new, and it's in MO1KX already, the execution trace port. Um, so, we do trace based debugging, and we have something like your write back to register file that we observe to see, to track register 3, that is the parameter for the LNOP. Uh, and we track the instruction, of course, and out of this, or the type where it's the STM. We have the software trace where we have like minimally invasive uh, like profiling of your code to just see like when a thread is started, when you have a scheduled session, and so on. And then we have this instruction trace, and this we barely use, of course, because it's a lot of traffic. Yeah? And the idea is that you somehow do on chip processing of this instruction trace to, for example, um, track like function entry, function leave. And only have an event for this, yeah, that it says like in function X was executed for five thousand cycles or something like that. And this is where like uh, my student Stefan is also here and Philip, they all work on this stuff. Um, and there's a lot going on and as you asked for it, uh, Philip can maybe show you his he was a student of mine before, who is a, a colleague of mine, and he started this uh, debugging stuff, and this was his presentation that he has on the on just show you like the highlights maybe. So what we actually do in there and what, what we are doing at the moment. Um, just summarizing, to get started, uh, just go to the website and be frustrated by the lack of documentation. Um, no. uh, in fact, we have a tutorial that you can start and get at least to the moment that there's Hello World and there are like messages going around that you're going to chip and we have something like yeah, for doing stuff uh, just to show like how it works. Uh, just get in contact with me if you want to use it for anything. Yeah. And there are many people at the moment that, that, that use it or want to use it and just email them. Yeah. Finally, thank you. There are like many people involved. And I, I forgot to mention, there's a lot of stuff. If you go to a repository and say, like, oh, you said something about shared memory, it's not in the repository, but because we don't want to make stuff public that we can't be like proud of. <laughs> so there's like a dirty code base maybe that needs to be furbished before I put it put it online. But we have a private repository that I can give you access to where you can see a lot more in the end. Yeah, we only want to put documented or at least minimally documented stuff on the internet and not everything that the student wants that uh, stuff. So that's the reason you can't find everything in there. Yeah, thank you very much and uh, I'll hand over to Philip so that he can shortly show you like the highlights of his master Thank you very much. <laughs> really interested in well, the, just the debug infrastructure. I know that none exists at the moment for the open risk stuff. Okay, so we, we have a separate debug chain, but there's no trace and there's no fancy instrumentation yeah. kind of set up. But we have a very long uh, disassembly. Oh, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we have a very long <laughs> disassembly, um, which is good, and instruction trace. Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, the, the fundamental thing to understand about all the debugging we have in OptumSoft, it's poorly trace-based. So there is no <coughs> whatsoever kind of run control debugging. So there's no GDB-like debugging, there's no stopping the processor cores, <coughs> anything like that. So this is the stuff that's in more 1KX, I think, already and I'm kind of working. I never tried it out. Uh, so all the stuff we do is uh, trace-based debugging. And uh, as Stefan showed before, and as this kind of corrupted slide shows, um, essentially that's the, the tiles you saw before, the compute tiles um, with the more 1KX processor in there. We have some add-on, so that's this case the structure trace, and uh, at the same way we also have that's network routers, both the network chip. We have some. Um, adapters there that capture actually um, 
statistics from the network and how many packets go through there, what's the like buffer size, how they're loaded. And all this goes through a separate uh, network and chip. Essentially, the idea is here to uh, not influence the production system or the, the original system in any way at all. Um, obviously then, which is kind of not really visible here, um, it goes out, in this case it was, before it was a USB interface, right now it uh, can't be USB, it can be PDI Express or JTAG or anything. And then you have some additional stuff in there that's called the cross triggers, you have that on ARM core side, I don't know if you're familiar with that stuff. Um, as well, so kind of you can define conditions. I only want to get a trace if there is uh, like this program counter in this range or if uh, the network is loaded over whatever percentage. Um, it also can correlate, so if that and that happens. So this is kind of the basic infrastructure that's, as I said, two years old and um, it's still in there and that's what we use like most of the time uh, for, for debugging, tracing, things like that. Um, is, is, that, is that runtime configurable triggers or is it combined? Yes, okay. yes it's a So you have the USB interface which allows you to configure all those triggers and get a data bank. So there's an API that you have. This is called this I think my end. Do we have some? Uh, that's, that's the inside. Don't care too much about that. There's obviously some compression on the uh, on the trace data because otherwise you have no chance. Um, yeah, I think that's yeah, that's pretty much the same still kind of. So this is the command line interface, and there is the, uh, as you see here, that's a very, very old screenshot um, of the graphic user interface, and I think Stefan showed you the more updated version last year, and I think it also changed a bit more. Um, essentially, this is the command line, you, you start the thing, you have a auto discovery of which modules uh, are available, and uh, then you, you have some log instruction trace, uh, the network statistics, and what we also do over this debug connection is uh, we can initialize the memories. So we just write into the memories and then and this command is missing at some point. So essentially here we would uh, start the system and start the system essentially means um, the, if the optimum clock system comes up, all the clocks are gated. So the production system is not running at all, just the debug system. And then essentially we just start the clock so you have a synchronous start of, of everything. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, yeah, so that's I think that screenshot doesn't make any much sense anymore. But still, it's essentially you still get in today's thing a view of the system, of what is auto discovered, and you get in this case it's a really basic instruction trace with timestamps, obviously, and the instructions that have been executed. Let's see what else. Uh, that's boring stuff. Yeah. So this is the stand, the way we're still doing it right now. And what I'm actually doing is research and this might come to OptumSoft by the end of the year, something like that. So to do more on-chip processing. So not getting all the data out, but putting some small, probably OptumSoft core or something in here that does the processing and just gives you some more uh, summarized uh, information of what actually happened. So not like every instruction that was executed, but just how often was this function executed or something like that. Yeah. So, um, what happens if the buffer that you're um, you're writing the PCs or in the ITM? Um, what happens if that gets full before you can pump every like all the yeah? They get skated. So there, there's yeah, actually the, the the production system will be gated. Yeah. Yes, there's actually two ways you can do it. Uh, for one, you can drop stuff. Yes. Or for the other uh, version, you can, uh, and that's what we do. Uh, just gate the clock of the production system, okay. get the stuff out, and uh, and get it again. Only, only for that compute tower. Yeah. Only for the, for the whole system. So the whole production system is then stopped. No, so the, oh, the entire system. No, yes, yeah. not the entire. Like the, the thing is, we have one version. So it was like the short version. Yeah. So we have like the the CPUs have. A, in fact, we have many cloud domains if you want. Sure. And only that all of those stuff. that can create traces are cloud. Okay. So yeah. So but, okay. So the, the correct way is it's not like it's not just one tile that's gated. It's all the tiles that are gated. But obviously, you cannot like gate the DRAM uh, connection or something like okay. that. That's the important thing. Audio. You should not gate the DRAM control. Only you are. Because then you get a It doesn't refresh so, anymore. Yeah. So, what was the area overhead of uh, the tracing system? In this, I don't have the, the numbers right now. Um, this was actually quite large. It was the initial implementation just to show if it works. Um, the main problem is buffers all over the place. Right. So you want to have rather large buffers to um, 
especially in the instruction trays, um, because compression is not really good. What, why is that? Is that because your application is like... Well, no, in a general, in instruction trace, it, that's just one was a trace message per instruction, essentially. You can, when we do some basic compression, that's like the stuff that ARM uh, ETM does as well, they essentially compress it down to one basic block. So you said, yeah. like, they're starting a right. basic block, and then there was like five instructions in this basic block. Yeah. And things yeah, like I that. I to see like this the notation of time gets lost in this library. It's yeah. already so, lost because you don't know where it is. So we track it in right there. Yeah. You can't look inside the code, and of course, anymore. you can't see right. how the pipeline was filled, and so. And if you have the basic block, you only have when it was entered, or no, when it was left in the end. Yeah, so it's kind of fuzzy already, so it depends. So, so in, the, basic in, in the end, and that's why I'm doing kind of not too much work on like improving the stuff here, you will never have, if you have a system like that, enough off chip bandwidth to get all the stuff away. Right. Even if you do the greatest compression. I think the greatest compression of instruction trace is by at 0.4% or so of the original trace, that, so that's the uh, precise. But still, if, even if you do that, you have no chance of ever getting that stuff out. Uh, so the idea is to do the on-chip processing and getting less stuff out. So um, can you also put breakpoints on data addresses, like load, load and store addresses? Uh, so no, no breakpoints of it, it's just watch points. Watch points yeah. um, but yes, so it's not implemented here. I think it's, run, I think it's implemented now. Uh, you have essentially the memory tile, the same kind of adapter, oh, and you can like uh, watch address runs. I see. So all this like triggering and detections maybe not that much overhead, but if you do some processing, what's the process it takes? So the overhead is, is not the comparison load. Can load you do like cross tile triggers? Yes. Or something? Yes. Okay. So there's a module which looks into yeah, all the tracing this, this module here, the cross trigger. So this is like it has some more input, but you can configure it from the outside just to configure the triggers in runtime. So essentially, this whole design is just like if you have a look at the ARM cross uh, core side, or um, I think MIPS has something similar. Uh, it's very inspired by that, and that's just a basic industry way of, of doing most of that stuff. The thing differentiation comes from the cross triggers, how powerful they are. So like Infineon, it has a real powerful cross triggers, and um, yeah. So but everything else is quite standard. So in research, we try to make a lot now on chip already because we simply can't have these terabits out of the chip. And so like many of them, like the like approaches, they put it in DRAM, they are just the traces and we did not offline, so the next generation of Intel processors will have it, that you can have a real instruction trace, and it will be put in the DRAM in a separate memory area there, and then you can read it out from the kernel again, for example. So this will be in the, uh, I think the SOC of Intel's uh, coming up. So that we soon that it's not But so research then is a hot topic. Of course, not many people really work in it because it's not that fruitful. Uh, but yeah, people try to have like on on system like real time processing of the traces to give you meaningful information. Because even if you get a terabit per second out, what do you want to do with it? Yeah, you can have a look at it if your machine is powerful enough to even display that much data. Um, but what do you want to do? Uh, you have to have some mechanism that help you understanding the trace. So essentially, state of the art, if you look at the regular like trace debuggers from Lauterbach or uh, Greenhill, they usually just have like one instance per core of the debugger open. So if you have four cores, you have four instances of a debugger, and you see four traces, and you can get can correlate them a bit by time or so, but it's still extremely tedious if they have a long list of just instructions executed or stuff like that. It's not very helpful. Did you did you implement like some? Specific specification, or is this um, no? There's no there, there is no specification. Are you plan, plan, do you plan to write a spec specification of like how to use your your ports and stuff? Well, how to use the stuff that is this I, document just kind of and how to use I guess like what interface is that exposed? Yeah, this is document. So we have documentation about all the modules, but it's yeah. not they don't follow any standard. Yeah, like the messages that come out at the yeah. end, this is they're documented, but they're not. So and it's actually also the, like, the interface between the tile and the, this stuff is just observe some signals, just take it out of the CPU and observe it. So if you think about a memory tile and everything. But using it for different core, it just means yes, that you of course have to change. If you need a trace port or something, or just uh -huh. get access to the relevant signals and then just change the interface. This is very so this, this, the interface is like totally boring. I saw this was a show. 
So is this stuff in your dirty repository or a clean open one? No, this is in the regular <laughs> repository. Cool. All right. So and it's a bit documented, you said? A little yeah. Bit? Cool. So this is actually all the, the screenshots and the, the stuff that works on the UI and stuff that yeah. all comes out through this interface. Cool. Uh, what kind of uh, frequency do you achieve with uh, such a complex system? On a nowadays FPGA, I mean? What kind of what, what, what frequency uh, do you achieve? Um, I don't think we have ever tried to get the upper limit on the frequency. We really really run it with 25 yeah. or 30 megahertz. Well, it should be like so the 75 on the vertex 5, which is quite old. So we have 75 megahertz. So it's it's not really bound by by the debug system because even if you have cross triggers, you just put in some registers and count them into your cross triggering. Yeah, if you know like how large delays that some trigger takes, they yeah, just start to trigger earlier. So yeah, how trigger much of the trigger. FPGA is filled when you get the 75 packet? Hmm? How much of the FPGA is filled? Uh, it was like 65 percent. Uh, it was like a two tile, 200 tiles on every tile. Uh, no, three hundred tiles on every tile. On a yeah, it's normal XCP. So I don't think we have ever done much optimization on that because we're kind of happy with that. Yes, and why did you choose to carry the trace of the main network? Like this is the one that connects the, the tiles, right? You yeah, but we, we, don't, one. we don't carry it on the main network. So this is this is the main network, the black one, mm -hmm. and this is a separate one. Uh, the the separate, separate one is that you can actually do cloud gating and that you can, uh, if you don't have that much data, you don't influence the production or the, the real system in any way at all. It's always yes. a trade. Wait, do you need all those connection points to the main one? You see? Yeah. Lots yeah there's uh, no, there's no connection. This is, so this is essentially like here is the, the line. The, so this just the router with the black and the blue. Uh, I see at least four connections between the black lines and the blue ones. Right. So no, this this is the router for this module. Yeah, that's a, that's a okay, this is not the. So this is the other network adapter. So especially yeah, here. So there's. I don't know what this has to the slide. No, there's also one module that has the connection from the productive to the debug mode. This you can use to, if you want to do something like emulation, yeah, let's say I want to inject some messages to start a task, for example. I want to send a, task, a message to the operating system to start a task for me. Yeah, just to emulate this, this behavior, or just to trigger the start of the application or something. But you should not use it to exchange debug data. And, and you trace both the, I assume you're tracing packets. Um, or can you trace packets? I just didn't get this right. You trace the instructions in the ITMs. Yes. But then can you also trace in the network on chip the traffic yeah. after you packetize it? Then you don't trace have both that instruction and data? Or just we just don't have any right now. So we right now don't have a way to co take out the complete network traffic uh, of chip. You could do that if you wanted to. What we have right now is just uh, package statistics. What I had was like there was a, there were two bachelor pieces that did some real tracking of messages in the network, so that you know at what time the packet traversed or not when it was a, uh, was a bridge router and so on. Yeah. But it turned out this infrastructure, to this tracking, it was like twice or four times the size of the actual system. Yeah, like the whole tracking, it was a lot of lookout. Because yeah, you, you, you can predict which way it takes because it's deterministic, of course. But if you really want to have all type stamps, all information, yeah, there's a lot of overhead to, to collect this, and you need a lot of buffers in the end. Right? Because there are like 50 messages in parallel there, and you don't know, in fact. Yeah. So you, you need a lot of buffer space to not slow down the actual execution. So this we didn't really follow up anymore. Right? So at the moment, for, for my debugging, I, I just take the mock as running and hopefully not a bottleneck, which it isn't. That's more than tired of the bottleneck. So essentially the structure allows you to, to output whatever data you want, but for, for our use cases it turned out like the structure is very helpful when you really need to get deep into and the log statistics are kind of helpful to get a broad idea of what So the most important one is this, this is not thing in the end, right? Yeah, so this is not in there. So we have this knob and the knob has a parameter. And the processor ignores it, but if you observed it, yeah, we have this LNK notation. And we use this one plus something that registers to understand like the context of it. And we have in the GUI, for example, there's the definition, like the ini file, that says like the first one that I observed means that it's a thread that started. 
the second observation of the same ID means this is the function address of the thread, and then we can just nicely display it. And it's just like a knob that's flowing through, it doesn't have much of an of an interference with the actual code execution. And this is just handcrafted. So this is uh, the same stuff that's essentially hardware assisted printf. So the hot the, the printf that goes directly to the debug system. And this is the same stuff ARM and core side does with the what you call STM, system trace Microsoft. Um, this is essentially the same concept, just uh, you have an instruction in your source code and it goes uh, through the debug port. Cool. Uh, we're a little bit out of time. Sure. But I, yeah. sorry, I have one more question. Overall with OptimSoft, what's what's the goal? I mean I understand the idea is to build a, a very nice research tool, which is what it looks like. Is there any uh, ideas about commercialization or spinning off and, and like killer apps or something for yeah. such an architecture? There are some like yeah some ideas in the back of the head of a few people to make something out of it. Um, problem is like with all this stuff of course the if you know there's the company called uh, Calray from from the mobile they have this MPPA, it's called, like a 6428-core system like this. And they had like six time, uh, six years now that they had that in silicon, and they are really uh, trying to get it to the market. I don't know about the impact that they have at the moment. You didn't hear about them, so I mean, it's not that much. <laughs> uh, but they're showing up everywhere now, right? And so this is like, we really, uh, think in the future, maybe a really yeah, market where many people get it. And, uh, See, like maybe it's more like on the, on the, on the um, for companies that don't can't afford the whole process of doing themselves, but would rely on something like this and, and smaller platforms. So, yeah. Cool. All right. Yes. Uh, did you do some tests with the branch tracing? No. With branch? Branch tracing. No. That means. The, uh, you don't trace any instruction, but you only trace uh, branching. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so that, you can that's, compress a lot. That's essentially like, so. Essentially, the basic block compression is just tracing the branches okay. where you have non-linear program flow. Okay. And uh, well, there's essentially two ways you can like uh, transmit the the instruction that was in the beginning of the basic block and how many uh, instructions were following afterwards or before, or you can like instruct like branch taken or not. Uh, both ways are done in industry. Uh, it turns out it doesn't make much difference on the compression ratio. So uh, yeah, this is kind of the, the way it's done. But still, this gives you like a compression ratio of 20%, but it's not great at all. So you need to definitely do some more stuff afterwards. Cool. All right. I think that's okay. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Very good.